Today's call, and probably we'll continue this on Thursday, has to do with neurotransmitters. And um, in the merging of brilliance, we are often looking for ways to take external models and take the insights we gain from that model and see how it fleshes out our understanding of the change grid and what's happening at different locations on the change grid. So we've always looked at something external and tried to put it in. Well, this is a little bit different. For the first time, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking we're looking at something that's actually going on internally. So instead of external things managing tension or describing tension, what's going on inside of this human brain? And, um, and obviously, that would mean that each one of these neurotransmitters is going to have some sort of an impact on whatever's going on with our chemistry. And what is the result of that, of that chemistry? Several of you on the call have lots of backgrounds in both medicine, neuroscience, and all kinds of related fields. And so I'm um, very much excited to hear what you have to say about this. Now, the diagram that you see on the screen was kind of like the simplest one I could find uh, that I thought would do that. So I have no idea who compound interest is or compound chemical. I've got no idea who they really are, but I very much appreciate their little chart. Um, I thought the, the quick little description they have under the name of each one of the neurotransmitters is very interesting. And I found this little paragraph at the bottom of each one of them to be useful in helping us understand the impact that that neurotransmitter would be having on productive tension or on someone's level of drive, as the case may be. Uh, now, as far as the organic chemical structure and all that, sorry, I really have no real interest. It is interesting how similar some of them are, though, but uh, that concludes my interest in organic chemistry. Um, okay. And so I also have up uh, for us uh, all of the change grid layers. So as we begin this discussion, we can kind of uh, look at those to see where it might live. Okay, so with that, uh, let's start with the first one, and that is adrenaline. Now, uh, according to this little chart, adrenaline is our fight or flight neurotransmitter. Now, as we've said in other trainings, the other two responses people have in a life and death situation are freeze and fade, I would imagine that freeze and fade um, are not something that actually is stimulated by adrenaline because they're about slowing down and becoming invisible and becoming, uh, um, you know, just still as still can be. I don't know that adrenaline would help us in that situation. So there, the little block at the bottom, adrenaline is produced in stressful or exciting situations. It increases heart rate and blood flow, leading to a physical boost and heightened awareness. And so my question for all of you is, what would happen to someone's level of productive tension if they have um, a, a, a flood, is floods too extreme, but they have a, a dose of adrenaline <laughs> released into their, into their system? So who wants to start with that? Um, well, Pete, this is, this is Ellen, and this reminds me very much of material that we had in our conversational intelligence course, mm -hmm. um, which I'm happy to share. And in that, we talk about the difference between the neurochemistry of partnering versus protection. And um, one of, and, and that's also, are we in fight or flight mode? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what happens when we go into protection mode and um, the body gets ready for us to fight or flee? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we have some um, listings of what are the, those that, that tend to go more with partnering, which would be the positive side of, of serotonin, the um, uh, dopamine, and the, um, oh, the... Um, what would they call the 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 cuddle hormone? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm blocking on it right now. But all of those that, in a sense, uh, create this good mood. Um, they talk about giving access to the prefrontal cortex and our higher um, capabilities. Whereas if we go into protection mode, we really shut off that access and really are more responsive to the chemicals that help us with fight or flight. 
-hmm. And so um, I'm happy at some point to share more about that, but this is what this puts me in, um, uh, in mind of. Um, and so again, it would be the two possibilities would be partnering or? Protection. Protection. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, um, when I'm open and I, um, I feel the, you know, the, these other, uh, both hormones and, and uh, neurotransmitters are, are present, then I'm in this open state in which I have access to more of my cognitive functioning, some of the higher level things like strategy, integrity, uh, empathy, and so forth are uh, in a sense available to me. But when I feel a, th a threat, when I've determined there's a threat, then I'm going to experience a flow of those kinds of chemicals, uh, including cortisol as a, as a major one and some of the others here. And that prepares me for fight or flight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I uh, cut off, in a sense, it's more the um, uh, primitive and reptilian brain mm -hmm. that gets activated. And so that's why it's so hard for us if we're really feeling stressed. Sometimes it feels like you can't think clearly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is Tom. Well, I, would, I think uh, what Ellen was talking about is oxytocin. Oxytocin, ah, exactly. Oxytocin. That, that's what I couldn't get. Yes. So, yeah. And um, so I'd be really interested in Brian's thoughts on that, but that is one of the, one of the main premises is, of conversational intelligence is how do you help people through conversation? And this is really great for the change grid. Modify this so that they begin to feel safe and trusting and so forth and that then releases um these other uh, hormones neurotransmitters and so forth mm -hmm. that open up and make um partnering more possible and that we impact each other um through the kinds of conversations we have yeah i like that actually this is brian and one of the things i think about as i'm looking at this list here is where they have the adrenaline and noradrenaline, that's really epinephrine and norepinephrine. Yes. And if we look at literally the biological design of what's called an adrenal response, the adrenal response anytime there's agitation and stress is simply designed to get you to move. Mm -hmm. That's all it's, it's really designed to do. So I think, T, you actually have done this already with that uh, cheat sheet where you put like the uh, emotional cues, the physical yes. cues, the reasoning capacities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's already on the list. We just don't have the, the uh, neurotransmitters uh, identified there, but any general adrenal response, I think it's safe to say without understanding the neurotransmitters, if it's an excitatory, inhibitory, any of those kinds of things. But it's safe to say that in an adrenal response, um, it's going to get you to move upward or out. Right? It's, it's literally designed to get you to move. And so that's where I was kind of curious to know, like at first glance, we would think that of the adrenaline or the epinephrine is really a tension raising chemical. Um, Absolutely. But does it also fact, move us out grid? It can, because think about it, the, the, uh, uh, that's why the, the, the other word for epinephrine is adrenaline. It is a hormonal neurotransmitter. So mm -hmm. too much all at once, again, you know, you're up there in stress, too much all at once is going to be counterintuitive for you. It's, not, it's going to counteract some of the things, but at just the right amount, it that's can be in the right direction. Yeah, because one of the things we say about the dark side of being too far upgrade, of being up in stress, is that while activity is very high, productivity is a totally different question. And that being up in stress, being that far upgrade or that, what do we say, um, adrenalized? What, is there a verb? Um, uh, is, uh, um, can be counterproductive. Right. So interesting, interesting. Um, now, uh, let's take a look at another layer of the change grid, because last time around we were talking about how intensity overlays on the five levels of productive tension. And so am I looking at the dosage then of the, um, of the adrenaline or the um, uh, epinephrine? 
What do you what do you think? So if I am um, up here, so I'm up in stress, but I'm at between six and eight, not at eight and ten or ten and eleven. Would it be correct for us to say that that as the level of tension goes up and intensity increases, that the dosage of uh, is it even referred to as a dosage? Those of you that are doctors and neuroscientists. It's more like a, a heightened state. So in other words, and then uh, uh, but but my, then, my my body has some sort of mechanism that controls how much of it is released. Right, and so you're looking at is you know right now if you heard like a loud boom, if mm -hmm. it's close by, you're going to have a different reaction than if it's somewhere far away because then you'll feel safer. Does that make sense? Sure. And so that quickly, the, the mind knows how much of a neurotransmitter or a hormone to release. Right. It's regulated by the, the proximity in terms of is it close, is it far? All of those things really matter. Right. So, is it happening or do, are we just imagining it happening? Right. You got to dream about it, et cetera. Okay. So then, then this layer of the change grid is really, uh, I think, useful to us. So again, I just want to finish the, que the, the idea about that adrenaline can also increase drive. So it right. increases tension, it also increases drive. And so we could then say that, that rather than, um, than the neurotransmitters living in a per particular place on the change grid, but I'm gonna put that to the, quest, to the test in just a second, that it instead is more of a change works maneuver and it moves yeah. us to some place on the change grid. Uh, so my, my debate, my question is that, is it true that in order to be up grid and or in order to be out grid, oops, sorry, you must be experiencing some amount of adrenaline being released into your system? Hey, this is Brian Diltz. Um, something that I, you're making me think of with adrenaline is something that police officers and military are constantly trained on. And that is that when you are um, high on adrenaline, you get tunnel vision. Uh -huh. you, you no longer can focus on the things around you. So that in the military and in the police, they train you to scan when you hit that adrenaline high. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so the more adrenaline you get, it, it, it must move you up into the stress. But that brings an interesting thought into how leaders get tunnel vision or anybody gets tunnel vision, uh -huh. the more stressed they are. Now, that, that's yeah. really interesting because here's my, my, my uh, I'll throw this out there in the dialogue. You guys can see how that fits into our understanding of what adrenaline does or where adrenaline kind of lives on the grid is that we've already said, well, upgrid situations can certainly trigger it up in stress. Um, and so we believe can outgrid. Well, what upgrid and outgrid have in common, they share the same perception of challenge. Mm -hmm. They differ in the amount of ability the individual feels they possess to meet that challenge. So, for example, if I am, um, I'm in Florida and I'm walking along a, a pond and an alligator emerges, if I have no experience whatsoever with alligators, I'm definitely going to have a stress response. But if I happen to be a professional alligator wrangler, um, I've been still caught off guard. I have to believe my body has still had some sort of trigger happen that says a threat is in front of you. But because I perceive myself as uh, having a higher level of ability to manage that situation, I'm going to be outgrid instead of upgrid. So am I right that nevertheless, adrenaline has been released? How I deal with that adrenaline release is going to be impacted by my perceived level of ability to meet whatever that challenge happens to be. That's absolutely spot on. It's the same concept with uh, uh, experts of emotional intelligence, right? They say it's not just about the feeling the emotion, but it's about what you do with the emotion once you feel it. So like I said, I've been studying a lot of, uh, in sports medicine, a lot of um, studies on professional athletes, right? So I think about the American football, or what we, um, we call football, you guys call soccer here, but American football, the, think about those uh, players. The orthopedic surgeons say the impact is like being in a car crash a day. 
So mm-hmm. I'm thinking what is going on in the person's mind to want that they have to psych themselves up to either get hit or to be hit. Mm-hmm. And you, you see the, the athletes, they talk about this adrenaline and rush they get and how they pump themselves up. And that helps them uh, from a sustainability factor in the game. But they have to know when to bring that down because it impacts impacts their capacity to actually perform a lot of different things happens to them if they don't bring it down to a level where they can actually manage themselves well mm-hmm. and so then um, to kind of finish off on adrenaline and how it overlays on the change grid we would say that adrenaline impacts the perceived level of challenge that you are facing Yes. So as opposed to saying like, hey, you know, it raises your tension or hey, it increases your drive. We could say, no, no, no. What it really does is it impacts your perception of the challenge you are facing in that particular moment. That, that would be consistent across everything we've just described. How you deal with that challenge might put you up in stress, might put you in power stress, might put you out grid, depending on your perceived level of ability to handle whatever that heightened challenge uh, actually is. Does that feel right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then again, to the final question is, is it therefore a prerequisite or a given that if someone is this far out grid at six or seven, they got quite a dose of adrenaline going through their system while they're in that area, um, or if they're up grid or they're help here in power stress, um, is it fair to say that there is, that you can't be there unless there is a certain level of adrenaline coursing through your veins? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of a, it's a cause and effect. It's part of it. We could say it's a characteristic of being there. Peter, you're unmuted. You can feel free to chime in whatever you want. You know, um, when I look at my change grid from years ago, a workup, when I was kind of um, in that upgrade in the stress zone or above power stress, um, I would say that there was some avoidant behavior. So there was a challenge. I knew I needed to do it. I didn't have the resources, um, but I was avoidant and, uh, and rather than the adrenaline, I was kind of, um, what's the right word? Just kind of procrastinating. But was that procrastination a form of flight? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Probably. It could very well be. In which case, it could still be that. You know, I, I think that, and you guys can, can certainly tell me, I, I'm not a neuroscientist. So I have to believe that a human is never experiencing one neurotransmitter in isolation. But then no. we are all given a dose of neurotransmitter soup. And whatever that soup uh, ends up containing uh, can give us a further understanding of how and uh, why we're responding the way we happen to be responding to that particular situation. So, Peter, mm-hmm. to your point, sounds like there'd be some adrenaline present, but I wonder what other um, neurotransmitter was in your, your bowl of soup. Yeah. Right. Exactly. None of them act alone. They all act. And that's the difficulty in trying to really map them with the precise accuracy is they Mm -hmm. all have, you know, they're responding to different receptors. It depends on if they're acting as excitatory or inhibitory. They always have hosts. So they never act as a single actor. Mm -hmm. And uh, Um, this is, uh, I wanted to add something too. And this is Peter, um, that our thoughts can also affect all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I heard a really neat equation on fear. Is, um, and fear is how bad times how soon times how likely divided by how well can I cope. Ooh, Ooh I'm liking awesome. that. <laughs> okay, say that again. So fear oh. equals, if you did an equation, fear equals how bad times how soon times how likely Divided by how well can I cope? That's amazing. Divided by ability to cope. Right. That's exactly what the nervous system is always doing. It's always scanning. When I talk about interceptive, it's always scanning externally so that it can match your internal rhythms. And when there is a discrepancy there, such as when we hear a loud boom, is going the amygdala is the body's alert system you have that on both sides of your brain right above the ears so it's going to say okay you're in harm's way 
Now it's up to you to take that and are you really in harm's way? Or are you not? Is it close? Is it far? So it's always trying to regulate these things for us on a consistent basis. And so um, getting back to this idea about, re okay, so right now what I'm, what I'm recognizing is that the neurotransmitters are um, tension management, drive management um, um, factors, if you will, maneuvers, just something the body's doing automatically. But does it also live somewhere on the change grid? So just to put that to the final test, let's go to a different layer of the change grid and this time look at how these different energies live. Is it fair to say that a driven driver when they have an activity plotting, remember we, we don't just, we're not talking about personalities, although that'd be an interesting little element to throw into the mix. But if someone has an activity plotting in the driven driver quadrant, is it fair to say, no doubt they have some adrenaline response going on when they are doing that, thinking about doing that, envisioning whatever is going on there? Um, or is it possible to be in the driven driver um, uh, state and have no adrenaline or whatever whatsoever going on? Hmm. I would say have some because they have a physical boost, something that's driving them out there. Okay. In other All words, right. there's no behaviors that just exist in a vacuum. There's always something underneath the behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, is it fair for us to say, and I know these are very, very big generalizations, but that's how we end up merging these, these kind of, these brilliant sorts of concepts. As the level of perceived challenge increases, so increases the, uh, the level of adrenaline being released into the system. To some extent, yes. Okay, and see, I think that was that was very much resonating with what you were saying that the degree to which the threat is present, or as Peter just pointed out, how bad is about perceived challenge. Also, how soon, how likely these are all impacting perceived challenge. So that unaddressed fear, um, uh, yeah, is definitely high level of challenge, and then I kind of uh, mitigate that with my ability to cope with it. So that's perceived ability would move me from being too far up grid to more in an out grid uh, driver kind of an energy. Uh, one last thing since I brought it up, many of you really do work in the world of personality typing. And so if someone actually has the personality, one of those type A personalities, one of those driven, driven driver kinds of personalities, if someone did some sort of an assay of their neurotransmitters, would their like basic bowl of everyday soup contain more adrenaline than the person who is a uh, very passive, downgrid, analytical uh, kind of type? Um, T, this is Peter again. Redford Williams at Duke, he wrote the book Anger Kills. Mm -hmm. And um, he found that these type A hostile driven angry, they had higher levels of cortisol. Mm -hmm. and uh, lower levels of serotonin and mm -hmm. unfortunately that they tend to stress people out around them and they also had a greater incidence of heart attack as well so he wrote the book anger kills and um, and a friend of mine's an anesthesiologist he actually did the spinal taps to check the serotonin levels and what they found is that these type a's especially with the hostility have much lower levels of serotonin mm -hmm. high levels of cortisol they get thicker, and there were even studies that show these people can actually induce heart disease if an angry boss can trigger cardiovascular disease in their employees. Huh. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, that, that's oh. interesting, too, because I'll throw one thing out about anger, and this is from the advanced uh, training and change works that I'm sure many of you have gone through. But the expressive expressive, or that, that expressive energy, that upgrade energy stress, can experience moments of anger but it is not sustained anger where the person who is living out grid in the out grid danger zone, that sustained anger, endogenous anger can be part of, uh, of what happens here on the change grid. So I can certainly see how the anger that someone is living in all day, every day is going to take its toll in many, many ways. Yeah, they're powering on and powering off. You start talking about neurotransmitters, you're talking about things that are short-lived, right? Mm -hmm. So they just reprise themselves. Mm -hmm. And so for someone that's up there in expressive, expressive, as you just described, they keep reprising this. And so they're sending these signals throughout the body that's 
deleterious to their health. And this is why it leads to the heart disease and all those kinds of things. We study that in medical school. It's just not a good place to be. Cortisol, the neurochemical, it literally cooks inside the body. So in other words, it's meant to get you to move, but it's meant for those to be a short-term effect. So people are always angry. You're poisoning yourself, literally. Hmm. And now is cortisol one of the neurotransmitters that didn't make the short list? It's a neurochemical. So you have neurotransmitters and you have neurochemicals that are producing the molecules. And that's the difference. You have to have a certain chemical compound to be considered. You have to meet a criteria to be considered a neurotransmitter. Because okay. a transmitter, neurotransmitter that's not on this list that I would consider it to be one of the workhorses is histamine. Mm-hmm. And so you have over, there's literally over 100 or 100 known to date uh, in terms of neurotransmitters. But they have seven, eight, or depending on some schools of thought, nine that are considered workhorses. So these that are on this list here, I would just add histamine to it. And those were what I consider to be workhorses. They're small molecules, but they do a lot of work. (laughs) Excellent. Um, so, um, So anything else we want to say about adrenaline? This is Peter again. Um, wouldn't it be fair to say it's addictive too? I think based on what we just mm-hmm. shared, you know, that if we're if our neurons are constantly getting triggered with this, and then the neurochemical cortisol, which I guess can actually trigger the um, receptors, wouldn't it be fair to say that we can become addicted to these states if we're outgrid? Well, yeah, I mean, we've certainly heard about plenty of adrenaline junkies, so I'm (laughs) sure that that's that's where that kind of label came from. They have to have that next conquest. They have to have that next thrilling experience in order to satisfy their craving for whatever that set of feelings that that adrenaline actually produces. But uh, now adrenaline doesn't really create euphoria, though, does it? No, that's endorphins. Yes, yeah, so endorphins. I wonder if it's a combination of adrenaline and the reward is endorphins. The yeah, dopamine. Like yeah, yeah, dopamine. Dope, there you go, dope, pleasure. Dopamine, the fact dopamine is excreted through the uh, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Interesting. All right, good. Well, this is this is really um, uh, interesting here. So let's go on to the next one. We got about uh, twenty minutes left in uh, today's little call. So noradrenaline, a concentration neurotransmitter, it says here it affects attention and responding actions in the brain, and involved in fight or flight response, contracts blood vessels, increasing blood flow. So first question I have is, how are noradrenaline and adrenaline related? Well, noradrenaline is a hormonal transmitter, and noradrenaline share the same structure of it, but its purpose and functionality is different. In fact, noradrenaline is the main uh, transmitter in the sympathetic nervous system. So when something happens, it automatically triggers a whole cascade of effects for blood flow, the breathing, all these different kinds of things. And so they're operating in different peripherals and central nervous systems. Their operational capacity is uniquely different, but they share the same structure. And so its role is to, um, um, well, it says to increase our level of attention Exactly. But not to the degree that adrenaline itself will do. No. It's, it's, it's working, I don't know, if more slowly, but with less urgency right. than it's, the adrenaline. It's, yes, it's, it's, it serves to function in fight to flight as well. But the you know increasing blood flow, the heart rate, these are things that are connected to your autonomous nervous system. So they're acting on the peripheral, but they, actually, they activate themselves automatically in any sympathetic reaction so you have sympathetic reaction to uh, increase your blood flow and heart rate up parasympathetic will slow them back down that's norepinephrine or noradrenaline Mm -hmm. okay and so um let's take a look at at the change grade again and again the same questions what what impact would noradrenaline have on someone's level of productive tension 
Well, it sounds like it's going to raise your level of tension because it's focusing attention. And when you start talking about physiological responses like increased pulse rate, increased blood flow, those are all characteristic of being more upgrid um, mm -hmm. also. So I think that's, that's kind of fair to say that people down in power apathy and apathy probably don't have a whole lot of, of uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine uh, happening. What's the difference, by the way, between calling it norepinephrine and calling it noradrenaline? adrenaline just the structure and design of it so when we are giving someone an actual medication are we're giving them epinephrine though right can we can i give someone a shot of adrenaline no the, like does, uh, it, does that come in a vial <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, you're giving them a, see that's why i always just call it epinephrine because it's is is you're acting on the adrenal Right. So mm -hmm. you're acting on that. But the, the common terms is epinephrine and or the adrenal. But you give someone a shot to epinephrine, you're driving the out. Yeah, right, right, right. OK, good. Um, and so does noradrenaline also move people out grid? So are people that are in the out grid area, the driven, whoever, any version of driver, are they also experiencing a heightened level of noradrenaline? even if it isn't as, uh, you know, may not be as far up the challenge scale as adrenaline would put someone, is it still a relatively high level of challenge or is it exclusively part of being upgrid and not outgrid? Thoughts about that? Not a thought, but a question. This is Tom. Doesn't a lot of high concentration happen in power apathy? Mm. You know, if you're in an analytical flow, for instance. Yeah, let's go to that background and see. So you're thinking like, because we've got that driven element as part of analytical, is that possible that they also have some sort of norepinephrine uh, or noradrenaline that's getting them to focus on the analytical task at hand? So that's kind of like driven analytical, analytical driver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be. Yeah, well, that's what, you know, good. what we're doing right now is all just postulating. <laughs> you just know. the question. Just... I don't know. I just say, think that as the adrenaline goes up, it's a more frenetic movement, whereas sometimes when you're concentrating, it's a stiller movement, but it's still mm -hmm. movement because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you're thinking mm -hmm. internal processing. Mm hmm and so is it triggered by uh, increasing perceptions of challenge? And, uh, um, and it has nothing to do with perceived level of ability, or is it impacted by um, the right ratio of perceived ability, perceived challenge? I mean, what, what's triggering it? When I think about it, I think about like the upgrade maneuvers, right? So in other words, is you can have your attention on something that you believe will create some value for you. But just by changing the standards or awakening the emotions, that's a different form of attention now that you have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the moment has now changed, the context has changed. And that's the challenge with mapping these things is very much a part of the context, um, you know, how we're perceiving things and uh, that matters in terms of what your, what neurotransmitter and neurochemicals are being marshaled uh, and, and working together. Mm -hmm. And so from what you've just said then, Brian, if I go back to the five levels of tension, I might as well use that diagram. If I'm down in apathy and I have a little bit of a increase in my level of noradrenaline, I'm going to become slightly more aware of, slightly more, oh, let's, let's use a different layer. Let's look at engagement rings. So maybe I'm going to go and have that. That's going to just make me a little bit more aware. And that awareness can certainly continue to go up as the level of tension goes up. But I guess what I'm saying is that it sounds like noradrenaline is about more subtle, steady, uh, gentle sorts of movement. Um, yes, yeah, there have to be a shock, you know, as it does with the adrenaline. Right. And but so... The physiological effect of it, when you think about, like, somatic nervous system, for every thought we have, something physically happens to the body. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we begin to think about things being more challenging, we have less ability to do it. Is you know, it's going to have an impact somewhere that's going to register in the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then I can see how as I move from uh, awareness into intention, from intention into engagement, my level of focus is increasing. Mm -hmm. And so it would it would plot that it would map that more noradrenaline is in my system as well. And we already know that that held true if we we're talking about movement through stress uh, along this side of the change grid. So just to check this, let's go to the opposite. So if I'm in a situation where I perceive no challenge whatsoever, regardless of my ability to handle it, would it be fair to, uh, to say that the level of noradrenaline is considerably lower than the other situations we've described? Yes. Okay. All right. So, all right. So then so far, does that mean that both adrenaline and noradrenaline are you described excitatory? They're increasing yeah. things to some level or another, but that adrenaline is more excitatory than noradrenaline. Right. And there, as I said before, all that's designed to do biologically in the adrenal response is designed to get the body to move. Okay. And so whether and what, it's moving I, in an upgrid response or moving in an outgrid response, it's still moving. Right. Okay, good. And then to, uh, to Tom's point, even moving from an analytical analytical to the energy of a driven analytical still implies some forward motion is happening. There's a, if nothing else, there's more going back to the engagement, sorry, going back to the engagement rings there. Good grief. Going back to the engagement rings, there is more intention now in the driven analytical than there was in the analytical. Well, analytical. When Brian said upgrid maneuver, I imagined, and we haven't done the learning neurotransmitter yet, but you're in that place, and then suddenly you have to get it done by two o'clock, mm -hmm. and there's a temptation to go way up drive, but if you upgrid, but if you keep your focus right, you'd have some of that neurotransmitter but you would just go up to analytical driver. Mm -hmm. and get right. Okay, right. and so... All the way up. Yeah, so I remember in chemistry class, we were learning about titrating a solution. So delivering just the right amount of a reagent in order to trigger a reaction to occur. So it sounds like the body is doing something identical to that. It's controlling the amount that's being released, obviously extremely quickly, um, to, uh, to make whatever uh, amount of movement happen. That seems to be appropriate. I mean, can you imagine? And maybe this is something that happens. You, those that are physicians, can tell us this. If someone, for whatever reason, ends up experiencing a sudden flood of noradrenaline or a flood of adrenaline that is independent of circumstances, so it's disproportionate or it's just happening, um, kind of. Uh, um, what do we say? Um, I, I don't know. It's just happening uh, without warning. Does that happen? Are there people out there who are suddenly crippled by neurotransmitters at an extreme? I've seen it happen in emergency room uh, during a rotation. I had to figure out. I said, you know, the family kept saying, oh, does this happen? I said, well, I'm, I'm having difficulty with this. Were they, they experiment with drugs or was something induced in their system? Because in my mind, something had to trigger it. Mm -hmm, and we, mm -hmm. we couldn't figure it out, you know, so you had to, that's when you go take the blood, you do all different kinds of things to see if anything else is elevated. That's the whole point of like the, the, the nervous system wants to preserve and conserve energy at all costs. So mm -hmm, it's not going to mm -hmm. just try to trick itself into doing something. So, you know, that was a, a big puzzle for me. I couldn't figure it out. Well, I, uh, the reason why it kind of um, crossed my mind was because of seeing like, I know that in certain uh, disorders like a manic depressive disorder, bipolar uh, disorder, mm -hmm. um, the now we're talking, I think, more about hormones than, than uh, neurotransmitters, but what do I know? I'm a lay person. Um, but I know that I've heard people say that 
like a wave coming across of them with nothing really triggering it, all of a sudden they're either deeply depressed or all of a sudden the mania, the, the mania has reappeared. And it's like coming over them as a wave independent of the, uh, of the uh, context of the, of the situation. So I was wondering if neurotransmitters uh, also have their own set of disorders that um, end up creating behaviors or life states that uh, are problematic. Absolutely. That's why I said histamine should be on the list because, uh, for instance, when histamine is present and it's activated, it decreases GABA. So it increases epinephrine and norepinephrine levels. Because, because the it, GABA is calming whatever's going on with adrenaline and noradrenaline. Right. So GABA, GABA is our downgrid maneuver. <laughs> right, so GABA and glutamate, those are amino acids. So GABA is short for amino butyric acid, mm -hmm. right? So these are, um, you know, they're, they're operating on both peripheral and central nervous systems. And so it has an opposite effect. So they're, they're excitatory in that they're getting the cells and receptors to respond specifically. So the excitatory neurotransmitters act in specific ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is really very fascinating, and I, I'm loving how it's actually mapping in a totally different way to what we've ever looked at as far as the change grid is concerned. Um, we have just a few minutes left, but I, 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 have to, I have to continue on this one question. So is there such a thing as a human being who is always experiencing an, uh, an, a heightened endorphin flood? I mean, are there are there people that are really um, living as as an endorphin uh, kind of rush state? That's a good question. I don't know that I know that, but I'm sure it is possible. Yeah, I'm just kind of going like, do they burn themselves out? I mean, how? What? I mean, you read the description: release during exercise, excitement, and sex, producing well-being and euphoria, reducing pain, biologically active sex. Oh, they're talking about the molecule. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting because I'm also wondering how many people are then taking uh, drugs of whatever legal, illegal kind of uh, uh, kind of set, but they're doing it because it's going to trigger some endorphin or it's going to trigger some dopamine or it's. Going to trigger something that they uh, they perceive as rewarding. Yeah, I'm so. seeing that now with a lot of the uh, uh, what do you call the CBD? And so, uh, yeah, yeah, the CBD oil for uh, uh, the CBD oils and other kinds of derivative of it. There's a lot of experimentation uh, in that uh, space right now. And that's what people are trying to do is hack. And they literally use that terminology is to hack the brain, um, you know, trying to take them to another state of concentration and just being fulfilled. That's, mm, but that's synthetic. You know, you're training your, your nervous system in your body that this, you need the drug as opposed to doing what to do. <laughs> that's See, interesting. Yes. That, could you say then on a different level that someone might be living in power stress is that possible is that yeah i mean you know as we've talked about on a couple of the recent calls i think each of us have kind of like a a home region on the change grid where we tend to like live so some of us do tend to be more downgridders. I'm the poster child for that. Uh, but there are other people that are out there, you know, shaking up the world and making all kinds of changes. Perhaps their their normal range of uh, of uh, of life is more on the outgrid kind of thing. Maybe it's personality. Maybe it's it's chemistry. Linda and I have a very close friend who we say as a joke, but on a certain level we mean it. We think that she's a manic depressive who has never had a depressive moment in her entire life. <laughs> so, and that is true. But, it's just that is true. She's it's, amazing. And so we joke, we just kind of go like, we won't name her, but we, you know, we just go like, sooner or later, <laughs> that other poll is going to come well, on. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I mean, she's in her 70s now, and she's been this way the whole time we've known her. So, uh, so yeah, I do think that, uh, that we live in certain places on the change grid. Uh, we have a certain home base. And I do think that getting back to these neurotransmitters, 
is that our personality? Is that our home base because our standard helping of neurotransmitter and hormone soup is the blend that it is? That that's our, our personal normal um, uh, chemistry? So, uh, yeah. So I think that's really interesting to kind of go like, is personality dictated by soup? So, yeah. That that's, a really good, that's a really good way to put it. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, because Brian said there's a hundred so or more that have been identified. Who knows how many uh, are still out there waiting to be discovered? And by the time you add in, you said, okay, we have neurotransmitters. We also have neurochemicals. And we know we have hormones. What else gets thrown into that mix? Um, yeah, and but then, some of them act as um, hormonal transmitters. Some of them act as like neural endocrine uh, systems, like histamine acts as that. So it controls like behavioral states or biological rhythms. So all these uh, so-called otradian rhythms. Mm -hmm. These are different than your circadian rhythms because these are sleep-wake cycles. Right, right. So an adrenaline acts as a hormonal neurotransmitter. So you have, the, that's why they're multi-purpose, multi-function, and it's kind of hard to map them because you would need to know so much about the context. And when mm -hmm. neuroscientists are actually studying this, this is why they like to connect um, the, the brain up to see which parts are uh, engaged and which parts aren't. Because there's always something proximal, proximal that happens and that gives them more detail than just oh this uh neurotransmitter is is activated they can right and that's why they're that's why they're showing you images or you're watching little right. videos right. to see what's what's being activated and what's happening as a result of that um right now one, one last thing i'll throw out and then i'll take whatever uh, final comments you guys want to share is what about food food as a neurotransmitter or as a neurochemical or as a whatever because when we're talking about how people end up with a sugar high well i get it that's a lot of glucose that has suddenly been released in their system but is that glucose all by itself creating that high or is that glucose triggering some or some other process that's impacting neurotransmitters hormones etc it's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that's, that's fascinating to me is that 90% of your serotonin is produced in your gastrointestinal tract. Exactly. 50% oh. 50, 50 of your dopamine is, in, is created in your gastrointestinal tract. Exactly. If, if you think about it, uh, uh, this is you know, just one of those strange mm -hmm. things. The Marines, before they do a, a uh, landing, they have a, a tradition of feeding the guy steak. Why? Because it, it changes their attitude. I mean, they may have been on the ship for three months eating your standard beans, but before they send them into the, into the water, they give them a meal that, that, that they think is going to um, change their attitude and change their focus. Wow. Yep. This yep. I see this is the, the, the point of like glutamate and GABA. Those are amino acids. And that's why I say histamine should be on this list because it acts like a neuroendocrine control so it's controlling mm. metabolism fluid balance all those different kinds of things so food is very much so has a chemical reaction in the body Excellent. yeah but you know what go ahead Edie. you know what the state could be more of a psychological thing that we associate it with you know a reward rather than having the beans. So I'm wondering if it's really physical or is it a psychological thing? For me, it would be ice cream. <laughs> yeah, for, for the Marines, it, it may just be, but, but if you think about it, um, mm. people have been expected to be aggressive throughout our history. The right. idea would be the meat. And you know, when you think about the, they've, in the last five years, the amount of information they've gained about your gastrointestinal biota in, in the uh -huh. or uh -huh. digestive tract is amazing. And they are showing um, very, very impressive, uh, very impressive mood alteration by what you eat. And, and what the, the trick is when, when you, when we say that, that the serotonin and the dopamine is made in your gastrointestinal tract, you don't make it. The, the, the biota in your gastrointestinal tract is what makes it. The bacteria, the achaea, the, 
the viruses and all that stuff all get together and, and they make those, um, uh, they, they make those hormones. Uh, Interesting. Wow. Well, yes. and now again, just so you guys know, I just found this one chart. I would be very open to having an expanded chart. So if you guys know of one that includes histamines or includes the amino acids and what each one of their impacts may be. I love this idea about saying, um, let's do a deeper dive into how the body itself manages mm -hmm. tension manages drive, manages our movement around the change grid. Um, and uh, the, I think this is deeply, deeply fascinating. So I'm open to receiving anything you guys might have to share. Um, our time for today is pretty much up. So on Thursday, we'll pick up where we left off um, and uh, just see what we can learn about, uh -huh. uh, about neurotransmitters and how they're impacting um, our, our movement. Uh, final comments from anyone? Off the chart brilliant. This has been an incredible session, really. Glad you've enjoyed it, Craig. Fantastic. Thank you all. Annette? Okay, so uh, we'll talk again on Thursday. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Bye.